People often get confused about blood pressure and what it means. Now, there are a lot of numbers involved, top number and bottom number and differences between the pulses. And the question is, how do you know what what means? And we're going to get into that. Yes, on this fast track, we're going to talk mostly about systolic blood pressure. That's the upper number in your blood pressure reading. Now, if your systolic blood pressure is high, it can cause heart attacks, heart failure, and strokes. So does it follow then that the lower your blood pressure, the better? Well, some doctors have thought so. But new research now shows that lowering systolic blood pressure below 120 is not necessary to decrease these dangerous risks, and it provides no benefit. So what's the problem with low blood pressure or hypotension? All right. Yeah, you're right. You know, for, for years we thought that because the problem of a high blood pressure damages the lining of the wall of the blood vessel and sets up the process of arteriosclerosis plaque to develop there. And because it can rupture blood vessels, that the lower the blood pressure, the better. And of course, the logic of that is infallible. It's right to a point. But do you get to a point where the blood pressure is so low that you can no longer perfuse the tissues adequately? And that's true. So in some settings, where there are already arteriosclerotic plaques, say in the heart or the, uh, in the brain in particular, if you've got a blockage there, and then all of a sudden you drop blood pressure to lower than what is usually normal, which would be 120 systolic, what's going to happen is you're going to get something called hypoperfusion or poor perfusion to those areas past that block. So what are some of the things that can happen to you if this happens? Well, if there's insufficient blood flow, it becomes a real problem in your heart, for example, is say the, one of the major arteries of the heart has a big plaque that's 95% blocking blood flow, and you drop your blood pressure from whatever it is to below 120 systolic or get it even down to, say, 90. Although, in theory, it makes sense that it would keep the process from developing, it doesn't stop, it doesn't provide for enough blood flow. So if your blood pressure is too low and then there's a blockage on top of it, now you can create a crisis where you could have a heart attack or a stroke or some other vascular event. So if you're not getting enough perfusion and it can affect your heart, yes. then you could get things like angina. Yes, or congestive heart failure or rhythm disturbances, yes. Or you could have a TIA, which is what you get when you have the warning signs of a stroke. A trans-ischemic attack. Right, it's sort of like when you have a signs of, say, being paralyzed on one side or have visual disturbances or not being able to walk right. Lots of things that can happen if you drop the perfusion, and that's the key, because we're trying to provide good nutrition to our cells. If our cells depend on oxygen and nutrients and they are not provided, for just five minutes the tissues die. And you can also have peripheral vascular disease. What, let's talk about what that is. That's another problem that's very interesting, because what happens there is you have insufficient blood flow to the lower extremities, the legs, because of blockages in the arteries. Now, if you start exercising, the tissue demands go up, and if you can't supply enough nutrition, oxygen and, and nutrients to those tissues, they start to cramp up. And then when you rest, it gets better, which is telling you that if you have poor flow that can't keep up with the tissue needs because of exercise, that you're going to have a problem with something called claudication. So let's talk about what some of the causes might be for this low systolic blood pressure. Right. Probably the, the most common cause we see is, is treatment with antihypertensive drugs. And, and that has a lot to do with it. But you could have something like dehydration. Uh, you could have uh, problems with uh, perfusion that lead, that come from a lot of sources. Well, like, like if you went into shock, sources. too. Uh -huh. Well, if you're in, in the hospital, uh -huh. that might be a case. But say you had poor adrenal function, which is... Uh, something that leads to poor uh, blood pressure control. You don't have enough in the way of adrenaline and noradrenaline, then your blood pressure will drop in that setting, too. And also, if you're dehydrated or you lose too much fluid, that happened to you when you were playing tennis. <laughs> I'll say, I haven't forgotten. So the, all these things that, that lead to low blood pressure are really talking about low perfusion. And we're ultimately talking about oxygen utilization, meaning how well does the body... How, do you, how well do your cells uh, use the oxygen that they get? And if you've got diseases of any kind, 
for any chronic disease, usually oxygen utilization is low to begin with. Then you add on to it low blood pressure, you've got a real problem. So the optimal uh, systolic blood pressure would be 120 to 139? Yeah, something like that. I think that's what we thought for a long time. There have been some wonderful studies that came out of uh, Wake Forest Medical Center and what they found that was published in, in the journal Internal Medicine in uh, June of 2014 is that blood pressures below 120 and, and still under 140 had no particular benefit in improving uh, people's ability to, have, uh, to avoid things like heart attacks, strokes, congestive heart failure, and angina. So what's the best way to treat high blood pressure? Well, we're going back to lifestyle. Lifestyle has always been the best treatment for almost everything. It's our most powerful medicine. If you can provide the, the best nutrition and you can reduce your stress and make sure that you weigh what you should and get enough sleep, uh, avoid toxic exposures, and stay in a, a state of mind where you have joy, you're going to generally do better. So the things that really lead to these problems have to do more with lifestyle than anything else. So should we, we should go back and treat lifestyle the best we can. So what, like, like when do we know to, to treat high blood pressure or low blood pressure? Well, it, it varies with each person. Uh, everybody's an individual. And for one person, you may have to have a blood pressure of 160 over 90 to be able to get perfusion past the blockages that are occurring in the arteries if you have arteriosclerosis, say in the brain or in the heart. And if you drop it below that, you've got a real problem. Yes, it still causes the process of arteriosclerosis to develop at a faster rate, but you still have to perfuse the, perfuse the tissues. And again, if the, if the blood pressure is too low and it can't provide enough nutrition to those cells uh, that depend on it in the heart or the brain or the kidneys or peripheral vascular system, you're going to have a problem with hypoperfusion again. So I suppose, too, with a, a high systolic blood pressure, it's worse if the diastolic is high, too. Absolutely. They both count. And probably, not probably, the most important factor that tells you whether or not you're at risk for having a problem with uh, vascular insufficiency is the difference between the systolic and diastolic. That's called the pulse pressure. So if 120 over 80 is normal, the difference between the two would give you a pulse pressure of 40. But if you had a blood pressure of 160 over 80, the difference is 80. There you're going to see wear and tear occur faster. You're going to have problems with arteriosclerosis sooner and with vascular insufficiency as a, as a problem. So everybody's different. And a doctor should look at each patient as an individual patient and then make a decision about where should that blood pressure be and what's the safest way that we can bring blood pressure into a normal range.